Welcome back to our inquiry into the Catholic faith as we explore the world of theology. Tonight, we're continuing our section, our lesson, on that aspect of dogmatic theology, which we call ecclesiology, which is about the teachings of the church concerning herself. What is the church? What is the uh, nature of the church? And what is the work and role of the church in the life of salvation? In the work of salvation. So uh, we began this last week and we noticed that there are different models, different ways of looking at the church by way of analogy. We looked at uh, the model of the church as the people of God, as the bride of Christ, as um, the uh, messianic community, uh, there's so many ways of thinking about the church. So we are continuing tonight with the section that says the church is a ministering community. And so with that, I now hand over the class to Dr. Esther Diane, my, my co-teacher in this course of theology. Okay. So we are on page nine now. Page uh, nine of our outline. Of our outline, and we're at uh, Roman numeral eight, the church as a ministering community, and there are a number of uh, biblical quotations uh, on this page that I will share with you mm -hmm. as we go along. The first one is, for the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, um, A, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we're looking at Luke 4, verses 16 through 21. Jesus, Jesus stood up and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That comes apparently from Mark 10, verse 45. Mm -hmm. B should be the church is to continue the ministry of Christ. That's from John 14, verse 12. And a quotation here is, Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. And then C is the Great Commission, which is found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Acts 1, verses 8b. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. Christ gave some to the apostles, some to the prophets, some to the evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers 
to prepare God's people for works of ministry, so the body of Christ may be built up. And then at the very end of our section on the ministry of the community that is the church, um, we're advised to go to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 14 and verse 27. We are one body. And Romans 12, 5 <coughs> um, through uh, 6a, we belong to one another. And those quotations complete our section on uh, the nature of the church. Mm -hmm. and the topic of ecclesiology. Continuing on the theme of ecclesiology, we are now going to take a brief look at what is called the apostolic ministry of the church. So you're going to need this one. Um, so you'll need the workshop, a worksheet that says the apostolic yes, ministry. This is important for us as Catholics because the uh, issue of apostolic succession is mm. central to the understanding that the, that we as Catholics have in reference to the nature of the church. Our identity as a Catholic community depends upon our participation succession of the church. Okay, so number one on in this uh, worksheet called the apostolic ministry within the church, number one is apostolic succession. Do you all see that? Apostolic succession? And then you've got some words to fill in. A, Jesus called all people unto himself to become his followers those responding to the invitation of Christ and become followers are called disciples. Disciples is the word we're looking for. Disciples. One, in the ancient world, a disciple was one who attached oneself to a spiritual teacher. Spiritual teacher, yeah. And just stop me if you need me to repeat these words that are missing. A disciple was one who sat at the feet of a revered teacher or philosopher in order to receive the wisdom necessary for living the good life. The good life. Good life. A. In ancient Greece, many of the great philosophers had disciples. Plato was one of the disciples of Socrates. Is that a true statement? That's true. No, I'm glad to know that. <laughs> and Aristotle was the disciple of Plato. Oh, I could add that in. <laughs> you could. B, is that all right for everybody? Yes. Yeah, and, and, and the fact that we can insert Aristotle gives a sense of success. Yes, yeah, exactly. So what, what did they come in? Plato? No, Socrates. Socrates came first, then Plato was his student. And then Aristotle and was then Plato's student. Aristotle was Plato's student. Okay. And the word is Socrates, not Socrates, folks. <laughs> oh, did I write Socrates? <laughs> no. No, that's how people pronounce it. No, but I have had many Oh, students. Socrates. So <laughs> What's that? His name, Socrates. <laughs> I never heard that. That's a good one. I have others. We'll let that go. Okay. okay. We got that for free. We got, we got that for free. <laughs> Okay. B. Uh, in ancient India, the Buddha had many disciples. The Buddha had many disciples. Okay. Gurus. Gurus. <laughs> were spiritual teachers, and devotees were those who sought the spiritual wisdom of the guru, devoting themselves to the teachings of the guru. C. In ancient. I'm sorry, let's try again. C. In Israel, at the time of Jesus, many revered rab rabbis, teachers of the Torah, attracted disciples. Number two, disciples are students. 
board is students. The disciple is the one who receives the instruction. The disciple's role is to learn by listening attentively to the spiritual teacher and practicing the spiritual teachings. There's a very famous saying in Indian um, religion, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. When the lady, I like that. When the student like is that. ready, the teacher, the teacher appears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Wow. I do believe that's good. I'd like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. Yeah. <coughs> Are we at A here? <coughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, the disciple is one who submits to the teaching authority of the spiritual teacher. The teacher is the master, and a good disciple is one who obeys mm -hmm. the instructions of the teacher. Otherwise, you, you may not be a student anymore. <laughs> the word that's disciple true. comes from the So it was practice. more like mentorship. Yeah. And that's the way the church did things for millennia. If you wanted to be a priest in the Middle Ages or in the ancient, late antiquity, you had to go live with the bishop and learn as an apprentice, yeah. and you were a mentor. Seminaries and universities and school of theology were a late development. Uh, it's interesting that um, Socrates would go to the homes of students mm. to teach them. Mm. And then when Plato came along, he reversed that and started a school, a school. the academy, the academy where the students came to the school, yeah. came to the school. So um, I've always found that to be an interesting mm. turn of events yeah. in the history of yeah. Western philosophical thought mm. in any event. Mm -hmm. And as far as our methodology. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that changed the yeah. whole learning structure. Yeah. 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 Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, now you still have private tutors and stuff, but usually you go to school and go learn. Right. And there's an history of that, of that occurring in other areas at that time. But in antiquity, they didn't have the institutions of schools like we have today. So you would attach yourself to a mentor. It was kind of like the model of apprenticeship. Would you go be an apprentice with somebody? Didn't we have that when we were young where you could become a, a, an apprentice as a printer or something? We still do. Yeah, yeah. yeah we still do. In some trades. Yeah. 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 Furniture making, yeah. 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 all that. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. kind of Even mechanics. Glass blowers. Yeah. 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 yeah, there are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I had a very similar thing. You know, I didn't actually start studying my spiritual tribal teachings until I was almost 40. Mm, wow. you know, and when I did, it's because I was ready and the teacher showed up, mm, which was just wow. like that, like a snap of a finger. Mm. And I studied with her and I, you know, and I had to obey her. Mm. I mean, in the sense of, yeah. because if I went out of, you know, if I did something that was different than what she said, then we would talk about it. One thing I really am so grateful for her is she never yelled at me. Mm -hmm. Because she had, no, because really, I mean, I'm like, I don't like I that. I think that's a good teacher. Yeah, it's a good teacher because if she had, I would have said, okay, bye. Yeah. Because that's just how I am. You know, I'm yeah. like that. Well, anyway, she was well, always I won't so ever loving. Yell at you. She was always so loving and she always said, well, what could you have done differently? Uh, and that's a good question because then I go, oh, la, 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 la. She yeah. goes, very good. You know, she was very loving, very kind. Mm -hmm. And she had another student and it was a guy and he had really long hair and he always had it in braids. She cut off his braid. Oh, really? She cut off his braid. Mm. Yeah, she never ever did that with me, but she, that was extreme. Yeah. But she says, you know, sometimes it takes that kind of thing because I think it, it had to do with ego, really. It had to do with breaking down ego to some mm. degree. You know, and I just wanted so bad to learn. Mm. And, I, and I actually really 
I appreciated her so much. I loved her so much. So I was willing to do whatever she said. And I wanted to do the best. You know, the other thing is there's always this conversation. If you do something not right, it could affect, it could affect the whole thing, right? You know, because everything was laid out in a certain way. And so you had, if you made a mistake, it not just would be the mistake, but how it would play out as a result of ceremony. So, I mean, it was very serious. So she taught me really good. I, you know. I, I, I really so this just brings me back memories. Wow, well, she meant it. Yeah. That's, that's a special <coughs> relationship. Yeah. Oh, that's me that's a oh, well, when I was a young man, I looked for mentors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to uh, go down one way of rabbit hole just for the sake of, of everyone's uh, interest. The Buddha. Uh, came to realize that there was a problem with making all of his disciples come to him as, as um, he was becoming more popular they were all coming to him and so eventually he gave permission to some of his monks to go out to gather new disciples but he told them they didn't have to come back to him. And, and in that way, Buddhism began to expand right. and to grow because he had given permission to some of his disciples to be, to foster more disciples as yeah. they expanded and went out. And uh, instead of- So he didn't try to control everything. He didn't try to control yeah. everything. Okay, are we at B? Yes. Jesus had numerous disciples, and the emerging church was essentially a community of disciples devoted to Jesus, the teacher, and to the teachings of Jesus. Three um, of, quote, go and make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I have instructed you through the rite of baptism we become disciples of Jesus, the teacher. B, from among his disciples, Jesus prayerfully called to himself 12 men who were to become his apostles. And the reference here is Mark 3, verses 13 through 19, and Luke 6, verses 12 through 16. And then we've got a list of uh, disciples. Simon, the son of John, Peter. James, the son of Zebedee. John, the brother of James. Andrew, the brother of Peter. Philip of Bethsaida. Bartholomew, the uh, Matthew, son of Alphaeus. James, the son of Alphaeus. Thomas, called the twin. Judas Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Now, one other thing I didn't list here was the women disciples. And after this list that Luke gives of the 12 apostles, he gives another list of the women disciples. And in that is Mary Magdalene and another one called Joanna and others. And it's said that they were the ones that financially sponsored the ministry of Jesus because these are women of means. You said Mary Magdalene and Joanna? Joanna were two of them. So um, I think it's interesting that Luke, after he lists the, all the male apostles, then gives another listing of the women disciples. And they're not mentioned by name in the other gospels. So they pretty but much Luke, bank rolled everything. Right, they, they did. Essentially, yeah. Right, they essentially did that. Well, uh, Joanna, for example, was the wife of the prime minister of King Herod. She was a woman of influence and power and wealth. Mm -hmm. And she's listed as a disciple of Jesus. We should, I should put that verse in. Veronica? Uh, Veronica is not mentioned uh, in the, in the text. That name does not appear in the text. It's, it's, it's a name that is applied to an unnamed woman who wiped the face of Jesus on the way of the cross. And it left 
an impression of his image on the clock. You know, that's quite a conversion for that Joanna. Yeah. If she was going oh, to yeah. it, right? Yeah. Can I just ask, uh, yeah. the first line, Simon, son of John, Peter. That's, oh, Peter. that's his no name? Yeah, his formal name was Simon Bar, Bar means son of John. Simon, son of John, or Simeon, son of Jonah. <laughs> and of course he was called Peter. That was a nickname. Right. Mm -hmm. Which and, means and stone. It, it's also important to realize that these 12, the 12 men, uh, it, uh, 12 of them, is a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel. That they yeah. were, It's they, a theological statement. It's a theological statement, and it's a... Um, his, in effect, a historical statement about the governance of Israel. Right. And the number 12, uh, is, the number 12 is a symbolic number in the Bible and in Judaism. And it represents the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles. And this is why when we formed the parish council here, I insisted there be 12 members because the parish council represents the people of God. So there was a theological rationale. It's not to pass the council, it's just to have us realize that we are the people of God. This is symbolic, and we have certain duties and expectations that go with that. Anyway, I I, 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 I do have a question. Yes. Um, in defense of women, why? Was the Mary Magdalene and this Joanna person given more mm. recognition? I've never heard of this Joanna person. Of course, we've all heard of Mary Magdalene, but that's, right. that just fascinates me. Yeah. Again, what, well, to me, it proves that women are still in power. Right. right now, so. Well, the, the, but the again, is it the hierarchy that per, I won't say purposely, but. Yeah, purposely. Right, well, right. Well, well Je Jesus, in the man's world. It, Jesus very obviously seemed to be one who was committed to gender equality. He treated women as equals. Yes, I believe that. But I'm and talking about to, everybody well, else. And, and then in the, the church and, and, and all of these teachings, and, I've never heard of this. Before. In the first generation, there were women leaders, and they're mentioned by name. But all of this has been repressed because... As Christianity expanded into the Roman world, the Roman world and the Jewish world were very patriarchal. And so to make Christianity more palatable to the Romans, they decided to suppress women's role in the church. And it's been that way for millennia now. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. In Rome, women had roles in the home but they had no roles in the government. And, no and public role. No public role at all. And they were behind the scenes. Yeah. The male head of household had con basically had control over everything. The male head of household could decide whether or not a, an infant should, should live or be put to death. I mean, it was absolute control. But yeah. uh, men were not part of the governmental structures of Rome, and eventually, of course, uh, the Christian Church adopts the Roman. the Roman understanding of the way to run an institution. And then women, they stopped ordaining women just like that. Yeah. Yeah. They got into, that's not the role of women. They shouldn't be functioning publicly. Their place is in the domestic world of home, in kitchen and in the bedroom. That's a very old prejudicial attitude. It's been with us for millennia. Well, and the Holy Spirit was, um, they, they, they were trying very hard to put a lid on the work of the Holy Spirit right. as well. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. there were any number of communities where the Holy Spirit was manifesting through the work of women. Through the work of women. women. And all that has been and, suppressed and, and was, forgotten. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. There were even some women who were bishops in the early church. And that's all been suppressed. But you know, just for myself, when I think of the Holy Spirit, I think more of a feminine side. Well, that's that is so interesting. 
Well, I've always thought that the word spirit ruach, is feminine. So the, really? the, the, in translating, the appropriate pronoun for spirit should be she. But we deliberately make it he. It's the suppression of the feminine in the life of the church. And that was to, that was an accommodation to the patriarchy associated with Rome. I would like to say the only reason anybody heard of Mary Magdalene is because she was dubbed a prostitute. And there's no historical there's evidence, no evidence that she was. No one realized it, that. It, yeah, it it's just a way of diminishing her. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's a, pretty much a vicious rumor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a vicious rumor. Yeah. There's no evidence historically that she ever was. Because they say Jesus associated that with sinners. Right, and of course. So they put a label on her. Yeah. Oh my God. That very same yeah. thing happened <clears throat> here when the Spaniard Padres came yes. to, uh, to our to here. And we had a, a woman leader who was, her name was Corona. And she was a very beautiful and powerful woman. Mm. And um, everyone revered her. Mm. To this day, we revere her because she was just amazing. And we didn't have a matriarchal or a patriarchal system. That didn't even exist in our conversation here. However, when the Padres came and everyone was, you know, talked about Corona, you know, Eventually, they turned it around and made that word also mean prostitute. Oh, wow. Isn't that terrible? It it's is. It's just shocking to see what men are so terrified. These people who are so terrified of the power of woman that they mm. have to do something in order yeah. to damage that. Yeah, thing. there's something yeah. there. That's and yeah, it's yeah. not until we actually started our language learning again that we got rid of that whole thing. It's like, that's mm. ridiculous. Absolutely insane. Yeah. And we just now revere her, you yeah. know, as the as the woman who uh, started the the first village, mm. you know, in uh, Petita. So, but that was when I found that out. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, "What? Yeah. So bad, so bad. Yeah. It's just awful." So back to the at the <laughs> end of the yeah, list. Yeah, back to our work. Yes. Um, <laughs> Jesus chose twelve deliberately as an eschatological sign of a new nation, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 tribes of the new Israel, uh, a new people of God, a newly constituted Israel. Even in this action, Jesus is claiming for himself messianic authority. Number one, an apostle is one who is sent. Sent, S-E-N-T. An apostle is one who is sent to speak and act on behalf of the one who sent him. I should put him, her. Or her. <laughs> the apostle is one who has been given authority to teach and to lead their brothers and sisters who make up the community of the disciples. In one sense, an apostle is an authorized ambassador. The word is ambassador. Of yeah. Christ. Number two, Jesus sent the apostles, and there's a whole list of things that the apostles did. A, to proclaim the gospel. B, to heal the sick in his name. C, to deliver the oppressed um, through exorcism. Yeah, exorcism is a big deal in those days. D, to teach. E, to serve. F, to forgive sins and to facilitate reconciliation. G, to baptize. And H, to preside at the Eucharist and the prayer liturgy of the church. Three, in calling forth and appointing apostles, Jesus formed a permanent community of leadership. This community of leadership forms a college in order to provide pastoral care for the church. Pastoral care. Pastoral care. The community of the disciples of Christ. A. The apostles thus formed nonetheless remain disciples and are still members of the community of the disciples. B. It is the responsibility of the apostles to maintain unity within the church 
by remaining in union with one another and with Christ. This unity is maintained by actively fulfilling Christ's command to love and to serve one another. Four, this apostolic ministry was to be permanent and was maintained as the original apostles appointed their successors. Thus, the apostolic ministry was passed on from generation to generation in what is called the apostolic succession. The apostolic succession. That's really important because our claim to be Catholic, we're just not making that up. It's based on the fact that we can demonstrate that we have this apostolic succession. Uh, I'll give you an illustration of it. I have two genealogies. I have the genealogy that I received from my parents, and it can be traced back. And in fact, in my family, it can be traced all the way back to the British Isles and uh, several years ago. And... Um, but the, um, um, oh, what was I saying? The apostolic two genealogies. Two. Oh, two the genealogy. other genealogy. When I became a bishop, I received a, a second genealogy. And that genealogy, which I have, shows me the bishop who laid hands on me and the bishop before him, all the way back to Peter. There's a whole line of succession. That means... Not only am I a bishop, because I call myself one, but I'm bishop, in fact, because I stand in the line of that historical succession. And it's because we have that that we can say we are Catholic. You're not a Catholic without it. But we have I that. that. I, have, I have that paper you gave us. Oh, you do? Yes. Good. It's a long list. Yeah, I know it's it, it's important. Great names. Yeah, it's Great important names. for you to have that. It, it's quite extraordinary that it's been maintained for two thousand years. So uh, do you have a copy? Of yeah, that? I do have a copy, and I'll bring it. I'll show it to yeah, you. Yeah, I'm interested in it. yeah, I'll have to get it for you. So if we're looking uh, at scriptures, if you go to Acts one, uh, verses fifteen through twenty six, Matthias was. Um, chosen to succeed Judas Iscariot who um, committed suicide and died after the at the time of the there was something about us maintaining the number 12 with the college of apostles I have a question um, we know that they, the, the apostles were traveling yes and they were you know um, do, but do we know where everybody went. Yes, we have tr what we call traditions. Okay. And like, for example, St. Thomas, there's a strong tradition that St. Thomas went to India. Mm -hmm. And if you were to go there to India to this day, I was talking to Father Chinapa about this. Mm -hmm. There is a mountain in India, and on the top of the mountain is the tomb of St. Thomas, oh, the apostle. Wow. And they say he's the one who brought Christianity to India. Wow. Paul and Peter ultimately went to Rome. And so, uh, and St. Mark, there's a tradition that he went to Alexandria, Egypt. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, they just scattered throughout the world. Some went to Antioch. Antioch. Bithynia. Mm -hmm. Mary Magdalene went to France, didn't she? Yeah, there, there's a tradition that she ended up in the south of France. Mm -hmm. I have friends who all. Yeah, it's there in the it's south of France. Oh, I've never been there. Mm. It's pretty cool. Five, apostolic succession is seen as being realized through a sacrament called holy orders. It is through the sacramental action of the laying on of hands that the ordination occurs and the apostolic ministry is then passed on to another. It is the faith of Catholicism that the church of the present is organically connected to the original apostles and therefore to Christ 
through this chain that stretches through time by means of the actual laying on of hands. Those who exercise, number six, those who exercise the apostolic ministry are called bishops. The bishops possess full apostolic authority and responsibility. The role of the bishop flows from the relationship of Jesus to his original apostles, to their successors. Um, you want to indulge me for a moment as I tell you a little bit of a story. Um, 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 I grew up, as you know, as a Baptist, and I converted to Catholicism. In the Baptist church, we don't have bishops. In fact, Baptists are anti-bishop. <laughs> they see bishops as the enemy. And that's because 400 years ago, the Baptists were Anglicans who were called separatists and nonconformists. They were radicalized Protestants. And the bishops of the Church of England persecuted them and saw them as a threat. So Baptists were a Christian church without bishops and deliberately so. They became democracies. And the idea of American democracy came from these Protestant churches because they were run as a democracy. So anyway, um, the, 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 this uh, development uh, 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 of, um, oh, I, I lost my train of thought. The development of the of communities without bishops. Of, about without bishops, so Baptists didn't have bishops. Um, is I think the point I was being was trying to make. Other churches do, but not Baptists. Well, when I was sixteen years old, um, I went to a con prayer conference at my local Baptist church, and this elderly woman was visiting. And she came up to me, and I'm a 16-year-old boy. She comes up to me, and she says, Young man, the Holy Spirit is telling me someday you are going to be an apostle. And of course, as a young 16-year-old, I would be flattered. <laughs> I'm going to be an apostle. I hope my mother is listening to this. <laughs> anyway, um, then she, I started laughing. And then this elderly woman pointed at me and she said, stop laughing because what I'm telling you is not funny. It's prophecy. And you will see God will do it. God's going to make you an apostle. The only problem is that in Baptist religious imagination, the apostles lived 2,000 years ago and they're all dead. There's no more apostles left. So I thought in myself, I didn't even knew that as a 16-year-old. So I thought to myself, how is it possible I could ever become an yeah. apostle? That's in the past. So uh, then, uh, and, and that's why I was laughing, and she rebuked me for doing that. Then um, she later died, and then I became a priest, and then I became a bishop in 1995. And when I was made a bishop, her son, the old woman's son came to my ordination to be a witness. And so I was ordained a bishop. And the bishops who ordained me stood up and were teaching the congregation, well, what's happening here is we're making a new apostle. Do you see he used the word apostle? Because the bishops are the descendants or the heirs of the apostles. So Peter's becoming an apostle today. Said that at my consecration. And when he said that, immediately buried, and I had forgotten that memory, the, I could hear that woman say in my head, stop laughing, it's going to happen, you will see it. I didn't think it was possible. And then after I was made a bishop, and they paraded me around, you know, and... Uh, then her son came up to me and he said, he heard that whole sermon. He knew about her, his mother's prophecy about me. And so he grabbed me and he says, my mother would 
be so proud of this day. And I knew he knew what it was about. So uh, the reason I mention this is that um, to be an apostle is to be a bishop. And even in my life experience, when it seemed like I was living in a context where that could not even happen, it happened. And the Lord, in a way, arranged for her son to come. After all those decades and years, it's quite amazing uh, to me. Oh, I feel like I'm bragging and boasting. Right? But I just wanted to share with you, sometimes God is has purposes. And it, it's not because I did anything great. I just showed up. <laughs> you know. You're at the right place at the right time. Right, that's all. And the door opens. What do you do? You that's right. Walk through it. Right. I can't take any credit for that. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Well, Thank you for indulging me. And everything happens in God's time. Yeah. Oh, we've learned that, you and I, haven't we? We've learned that. <laughs> Okay, so back to the back to the lesson. Back to the lesson. Six A. A. Uh, with priests and deacons to help them, the bishops preside over the people of God. B. Bishops are a sign of unity within their own diocese, community, or local church. C. Christ is fully present in each local community when that community is united to its pastor, the bishop. The bishop is the vicar of Christ within his own faith community. Uh, the word vicar means representative, in case you don't know that word. The bishop is an icon of Christ. St. Ignatius of Antioch in 110 AD that's quite early. Yeah, said, quote, where the bishop is, there is the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. quote. That's the probably the first um, record we've got of the use of the word bishop. And maybe for Catholic Church. And Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. e, as a sign of unity, the bishop plays a twofold representative role within the church. The bishop represents the local church, the diocese, to the universal Catholic Church, the bishop also represents the universal Catholic Church to the local church or diocese. F, the bishop is the primary pastor teacher within the local church or diocese. G, the fullness of the priesthood of Christ is embodied for the local church or diocese in the person of the bishop. So I would recommend that we re redo this and get rid of all those words, diocese. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Okay. <laughs> the bishop is the ordinary minister of all the sacraments of the church. I. The bishop may delegate to other ministers the authority to celebrate some of the sacraments of the church. Presbyters, it's another name. Presbyter is P-R-E-S, B as in boy, Y-T-E-R-S, presbyters. Presbyters, priests. Priests. And deacons. This process of delegation in itself is a sacrament of the church called ordination or holy orders. J. Only the bishop may celebrate the sacrament of holy orders. Um, I want to come back and talk about that in a second. Okay, this threefold ministry of the church, bishop, priest, and deacon, is called the hierarchy, which, which means sacred, sacred rule. Yes, yeah, sacred ruler, yeah. Not a ruler that you measure with, but ruler <laughs> that you need. It's very uh, feudal. You know this language, a lot of feudalism. Yes. It's, it's the medieval civilization. 
and ill besides the three major orders of bishop, priest, and deacon. And the three major, major, major they're orders. called major orders. orders. Bishop, priest, and deacon are the major orders, but we also have minor orders. Um, and the minor orders are all the other ministers, like the um, alkalite and server at the altar, Eucharistic minister, all these are other the, minor yeah, orders. So the, the major orders are the episcopacy bishops, the presbyterian priests, and the diaconate deacons. There are minor orders of ministers, such as lector, porter, Ephesus, acolyte, oh. and subdeacon. It's all there. Exorcist. Yeah, exorcist is a minor ministry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a, kind of disappeared, but it's still there. And what's a porter? A porter is someone who has the keys to the church and opens the door for the people. In a way, it's kind of come down to the ushers of the church. Sure. And the porters also used to lock the church. Yes. So that people that weren't baptized wouldn't be able to come in and wouldn't see what was, in. what was going on. <laughs> yeah. um, I have three blanks, but there's only two words. They are, there are minor orders of ministers. There are the minor orders. The minor, the minor orders, orders of, of ministers, ministers. colon. Lector, porter, exorcist, acolyte. Acolyte is the uh, server at the mass. You've been doing the work, uh, uh, the minor ministry of acolyte, Gary, when you carry in the cross and do help serve mass. What's a subdeacon? It's a minor order. There used to be a ceremony to, you know, to bless someone who's doing it. Really? What's a subdeacon? A subdeacon um, is can do some of the things a deacon can do, but not everything. So we call it a subdeacon. And they have a distinctive vestment they wear that's different from the deacon to know the difference. So a subdeacon serves at the altar during the liturgy. And we have people who are acting in that role. When we have lay people, when they come up to help serve and they do more than serving, they're acting like a subdeacon. So these ministries are still happening, although we don't label them as such. But in a way, Gary, you're, you're participating in what we would call a minor order when you do that. And historically, people that wanted to become priests Had to would, do all would go through all do these all uh, okay. minor orders in yes. their, yeah. as part of their Formation. Yeah, I had to be ordained to each minor order when I was going through seminary, each one. So that's apprenticeship right there. And that's a it's apprenticeship. Yes, right there. exactly. You all the steps there. That's right. And some of those could be done while you were in seminary. You know? Right, that's what they do. That's, they put it on the fast track. They want you to get out there working as a priest. And, and I, what, back in K about the the okay. full ministry of the church, the bishop, priest, and deacon. I wanted to just make a comment that uh, in, among the Methodists, for example, I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, the Wesleys could not get a bishop to come over to the New World, and they and they were um, mm. baptizing <coughs> people, and a lot of people. You probably heard of the Great Awakening, and there were two times in American history where this became oh, a, a very major thing that was happening among folks. And the, the Methodists had um, people going out on horeback in rural... Was that when they had lots of tents and gatherings? Yes, yes. 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 Those yeah, that tents and gatherings and rural ministries and lots of baptisms. Revivalism. And, uh, lots yeah. of revivals and a lot of people claiming to have personal religious experiences and and then being baptized and, and all that kind of thing, but they could not get bishops to come over and what eventually they decided to do was to start ordaining priests themselves because they couldn't get a bishop. So yeah. they 
So that broke, in, in the Methodist Church, that broke the tradition of apostolic ministry because they were not being mm. ordained <laughs> by by bishops. It was a, they didn't have any. Other it was way. a that's what they were. It was a presbyterial uh, ordination and, and not an episcopal ordination. Well, but they, is, but they yeah. adopted they do, adopted the word bishop. So the Methodist Church does have bishops. But, but they don't stand in a historic But they don't lines. stand in a historic apostolic mm. line of succession because it was broken. Mm. So I just I just find that interesting. And and of course then there are other Protestant denominations that just rejected the whole they yeah. just threw it out because they were so um, uh, entrenched with the idea that uh, the, that tradition was bogus. <laughs> they were rejecting tradition. And, and teaching authority and everything that went along with it when they threw yeah. away, but when they threw tradition well, away. Well, I think, I, th I think that they had the point of view that, that they had a relationship with God. Mm. They didn't have to go through anybody else to have a relationship yeah. with God. Yeah. So that was that individualism that was developing mm. uh, in our democracy, you know. Mm. It was that individualism yeah, was a very, a very different mindset. Yeah. yeah. Um, individualism will come later. Yeah. In, in congregational churches, primarily. Okay, who are the original apostles, the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ? And the and those folks, uh, the twelve, okay, the original twelve apostles, and then Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes known as Paul. He starts calling himself an apostle. Mm -hmm. Comment. Did he ever know the historical Jesus? Mm. The no, answer, he didn't. He, he did not. No. Did he ever get to know the risen Christ? Answer? No. Um, well, yes. He was not in That's a body. Nice. He, he had a voice. He claimed he had a... But he did have an inspiration. Yeah. A direct... Um, a revelation. Revelation. Four, Mag Mary Magdalene, who... We even have a text that says she is the apostle to the apostles. There you go. She's yeah. called an apostle. She's called an apostle. One wishes that the patriarchy of the church would recall that. Number five, um, Andronicus. Who is he? Well, he's called. He's written in the book of Romans or letter to Romans. Uh, Paul sends a greeting to him and identifies him as an apostle. And so there was an apostle named Adronicus, but he wasn't a member of the Twelve. Joanna and Junia, um, that's, we find that in Luke 8. These are um, women. women that Paul identifies, well, not in Luke, but in Romans, uh, identified. So it's two women. To the two women and the Junia. Yes, and what happens in the translation of the Bible is that there were um, translators who were so affronted by the idea that Juna, Junia could have been a woman that they changed the name to a male name. They, they deliberately yes, mistranslated they, her name. Why they deliberately <laughs> mistranslate? Oh, it's, it, it was a, 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 an intentional act of suppression. Is that where you yeah. the name? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Seven, James, the brother of our Lord. And eight, the women apostles, and this is a quote, Jesus journeyed from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Accompanying him were the twelve, and some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Uh, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Shusa, Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So, Luke 8, 1 through 3, that would be after the 
list of the apostles. The 12, yeah. Then they returned from the tomb and announced all these things to the 11 and to all of the others. The woman were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. And these are the first witnesses of the resurrection. Yeah. That quote. That's important. Mm -hmm. Other women. Mary, the wife of Clopas, or Cleopas, Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph, and Salome. Oh, Clopas was the uncle of Jesus. Okay. He was the brother of Joseph. There were many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Those are the, the women who uh, were there observing the crucifixion. James was Joseph's brother. Yeah. Yeah. James was Jesus' brother? Yes. So in the previous sentence up here, um, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, is that another James? Yeah, that would be, because James and Joseph and Mary, these were common names. Mm -hmm. All, almost everybody had those names. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to tell who exactly they're talking about unless they I, give us further information like James, the son of Alphaeus, mm -hmm. or James, the son of Zebedee, didn't mm -hmm. know who they're talking about. I don't, James, that's the English rendering but it would have been the name Jacob. James is a form of the name Jacob. How, um, what was the life expect expectancy of people at that time? Because I'm, try I'm trying to figure out how, how long Mary, um, Jesus' mother, would have been around. Well, right? we... Because she was very young. She was very young. And we think that she lived quite late into the first century and could have. Because she was only about 13 or 14 when she gave birth to Jesus. And Jesus was in his early 30s. She would have been in her 40s. So she would be in her late 40s. So right. I was wondering how long did people live? Well, um, back in the early or what we call late antiquity, um, the average lifespan was less than 30 years. But that was because of the high child and infant mortality drove the number down. Because in late antiquity, you would occasionally find an occasional person who would live into their 80s and yeah. 90s. But it was it rare. Was people, most people didn't make it that far. But 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 you could live long if you so had good So it's possible that she lived into her 50s, 60s, even 70s. That's right. And we think so it was very... she could have lived like 30 years longer after she the could have. event of his crucifixion. That would, that would be plausible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. The other um, comment I want to make just before we end tonight and close to the, the end of our time together is that... Um, in many ways, it's pretty miraculous to me that the names of the women were, are put into the texts that were written mm -hmm. at all, yeah. given the kind of patriarchy mm -hmm. that existed. So that yeah. It's, it's amazing that um, we find the names of the women in the Gospel of Luke and, um, and Matthew and, and Mark and, and John. And, and what makes it even a little bit more interesting is that there were so many women in the Gospels that had the name Mary. Yeah. Mary was a common name. It kind of reminds me of a story. There was an Irish family. <laughs> Did I tell you this? There was an Irish family that came to our church, and they had nine daughters. I told you this story. And they named every one of them Mary. <laughs> but it was like Mary, Beth, Mary Catherine, you know, you you know, okay. the Irish will do that, they'll name everybody Mary. Well, in the Gospels, you see all these women named Mary. Well, the, the first century Jews were like the Irish. They named all the girls Mary. <laughs> I had a male cousin with a middle name Mary. Yeah. At school Mary. <laughs> and when my mother told me, I was like, what? <laughs> Well, sometimes there's 
a devotion, you know, and that, you know, yeah. there's a devotion. And it's just like well, my brother, his name was Francisco in the music building because my parents had a devotion to St. Francis mm -hmm. about him. Yeah. They wanted his son, and they said, if, he is a, if we have a son, we will name him after you. That's, that's, people would do yeah. that. Yeah. So it's, you know, those kinds of things happen. So we well, should probably yeah. include. We are out of time for the evening. We so are. Bishop Peter, would you bless us, please? I'll give a prayer. A prayer, a prayer first. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. peace be with you. And also also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we are thankful for all that you have done for the sake of our salvation, and how you have acted through your church and through your holy apostles, both men and women, to bring us the truth of your Son's message and gospel. We pray that you will inspire our minds that we may understand and comprehend everything that has been given to us in this teaching. We ask this through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also and also with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.